again. Whatever goes on up there that you see in the news, be assured it's 180 degrees different than what actually is going on. All right? There ain't nobody going to get in too much trouble, I don't think. There ain't none of this or that or the other going to happen. It's all a diversion because we're dealing with demons, you see. But that's not the way it's supposed to be in the church and with Christians. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be like the world and as the world and of the world. First Corinthians, the 13th chapter, let me pick up with you in verse 4. We know that the word charity here is love. And it's not just the love between a man and a woman. It's the love of an attitude of a child of God of a Christian. But it applies to Christian men and women also. Okay? Husbands, wives, so on and so forth. Charity suffereth long. It is kind. Charity envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Love is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, love endureth all things. Love never fails unless, unless, Love is not what it should have been beforehand. You can't say love endures all things when love is facing hate. When love is facing that which is not love, love cannot understand that. Love cannot endure that. Love cannot bear that. When love is not what we started out discussing love to be. Love cannot suffer something that is insufferable because it lacks love, because it lacks truth. Do y'all stand with me? I wonder if you've ever been treated rudely. You ever been treated rudely? Have you ever drove around out there at the mile at Dick's Sporting Goods, waiting for a parking space to come open. And finally, you see as you're going down this side, one backs out over there, and you go around and you almost get there and some little squirt and a, a, some electric piece of junk car slides in there and gets your spot. You think, how rude! Have you ever been to church function? It doesn't happen here. Or at a Christmas party. Or a gathering of people. And man, there's a big sliver of peanut butter pie. And it's just a little bit bigger than the rest of them. And you watch and you think, well, nobody's gone over it yet. And as soon as you go to get somebody bumps you out of the way and they take that big sliver. You think, how rude! Or you go and you do something for somebody you're trying to help you and they act like, you should have done that anyway. They expected you to do that. How rude! Maybe you've treated somebody else rudely. Have you ever done that? All of us experience and have experienced rudeness. But if we're going to be like God, if we're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must acquire a love that is not rude. We look at the characteristics here of love in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. One of those things that it says love is not in verse 5, it does not behave itself unseemly. What if love, and one claims to be of love, behaves itself unseemly, rudely, 
Is that to be tolerated? Is that to be accepted? Is that to be uh, bared with? Is that to uh, be endured? Is that to hope with a love that does not behave itself rightly? Well, you're shaking your heads correctly. No. That which is to be endured, that which is to be worked with, to be bore with, is with a love that suffers long, with a love that is kind, that envieth not, that doesn't vault itself to be greater than somebody else, that doesn't seek things for themselves, is not even easily provoked. In other words, when you're dealing with somebody and they're all happy and everything's all right to the wrong word is said or the wrong person's brought up in the wrong situation, and then, boy, they change. Have y'all seen, how many of y'all watched uh, the first Jurassic Park? Y'all, about all of you watched the first, I loved the first Jurassic Park. You remember when that fat man was going, driving in the storm, or, and he wrecks that Jeep and he can't get out? Y'all remember that? And that can falls out where he's trying to get the little embryos of dinosaurs. He's going to sell for all kinds of money. And he goes out and he hooks his Jeep up to the truck or to the tree so he can pull himself out. He gets up and he gets in there and there's that little sweet dinosaur. He goes, hee, wee, wee, wee. And he goes, you remember that? That's the way some people are. You never know what's going to set them off. You never know what's going to make them grow crazy. You know how? No, no, how they're going to go from sweet, kind, loving to just want to eat you alive. That's not love. And that doesn't have to be endured. It is not becoming. It is not something to be overlooked. It is not something to bear with. Love does not act improperly. Love does not act dishonorably. Love does not act indecently. Love is not ugly. Love doesn't have an ugly side. It's not uh, ever in an unbecoming manner. It's not two-faced. It doesn't have split personalities. Love doesn't needlessly offend it doesn't act crudely. Love is always to behave itself. And we're not always good and perfect at that. And sometimes when we mess up friendships or we mess up relationships with others at work or this or that because we've not loved like we should, we have to step back and let the Lord take control of things and work things out. You know, it's kind of like you watch some of these shows where a woman's caught messing around on her husband. You know, she's so sorry. She's done so wrong and I'm so, oh, please, I've been wrong. Instead of accepting her responsibility for what she's done, after she realizes that the forgiveness ain't there and everything ain't going to go back, she becomes that animal in the Jeep. And she's ready to cause destruction and damage and hurt. And she tries to destroy people and tries to destroy that in which maybe she was responsible for messing up, you know. That ain't the way love is. Love doesn't needlessly go out to be cruel. It always behaves itself. It acts properly, honorably, Decently and with grace, love does. Even when we're done wrong, we turn around and love as Christians to act right anyway. Rather than being uh, uh, rude, rather as verse 5 says, rather than uh, behaving unseemly, love is to act politely. With courtesy. If you really love somebody, you don't have a problem with that, do you? If you really love somebody, you don't love them for 10 minutes and hate them for 10 minutes and love them for 10 minutes and hate them, do you? 
Golly, man, could you imagine going in and uh, squeezing up on your wife or giving her a kiss or a little patty pat here or there and getting an attitude? Like the thing in the Jeep. Is that love? That ain't love. That ain't love. Women, if your husband did you that way and they come, you went up trying to be loving on them, physical with them, and they acted like that, is that love? No, that's what you got to deal with a psycho. Why do they stick around if they ain't happy? That's not love. Have you ever heard someone say, well, that person means well. They just come across harsh. It's just their way. Have you ever heard somebody say that about somebody else? Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know me. I just say what's on my mind and I'm that kind of person. I'm going to say it if I feel like it. Have you ever heard anybody say that about themselves? Well, if you say that about yourself or cause others to say such things about you, then that's just wrong if you're a Christian. Love's not rude. It doesn't act, behave itself unseemly. It's not easily provoked. It thinketh no evil. So right now, if there's something going on in your life, and oh, you're, if it don't work out my way, oh my goodness, I am, this is going to be awful for them or those people or that group. If that's your attitude, that ain't a Christ-like attitude, and that's totally against everything that 1 Corinthians 13 just said. If you can't wait to get in the church house and if you can even the score, you can cause this problem, you can say that about this or that one or the other, that's totally against what 1 Corinthians 13 just said, is it not? Does your attitude have to be condoned by me because I have love if you're in the wrong? Absolutely not. It's up for you to change your attitude so that the love of Christians can accept you, can bear with you, can endure you. We can't excuse our bad conduct by blaming your personality or your heredity. Ah, he's just like his daddy. She's just like her mama. Those are excuses. And there are no excuses when it comes to love or the lack of, lack of love or the proper love as we see in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. There is never any, an excuse for a Christian to behave themselves unseemly. There's never an excuse for that. There's never an excuse for a Christian to have what you'd call a split personality. Never an excuse for that. Never an excuse for a Christian to treat another Christian without love and without compassion and without caring, especially if you're in some sort of relationship or a husband and wife, uh, Christians in Christ. No, there's never an excuse for that. You can find them in the books but not in the book. It shows us what love is. It shows us what is to be bored with, what is to uh, hope in, what is to endure in. Shows us what kind of love never fails. All the other types of love, I'll promise you this, they will fail. When it is not the love in which the Word of God plainly teaches in First. Corinthians, the 13th chapter, describes. If we really want to show people that the love of God dwells in us, it's not an example just for a day or for a week or for a month. It's a lifestyle of change to show them that the love of Christ dwells within us. And when we are done wrong or we do wrong, we don't seek retribution or to get even, not if we have the love of Christ. And it's still we possess, seek to strengthen the love as is taught by Paul here in the 13th chapter. Now, rudeness, that which behaves itself unseemly, 
can express itself in a lot of different ways. A person can say something rude. A person can do something rude. Or a person can fail to do something. And in that failure, in that omission, is rudeness. Like failing to say thank you. That used to be something people said in this country. Used to be something people said. Thank you. You've done something for me. You waved me on across the road. And don't that make you, that, 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 this burns me up. And I've got to work. I, got, I pray hard on this. I do. But I get up to a stop. And you know, it's my turn to go or whatever. But uh, maybe there's a big line of car or whatever. And you wave somebody over in front of you. It used to be a time they say, thank you. Appreciate it. Now they say, like I deserve to go first. That, 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 that chalks me bad. See, I got things I got to pray on too. I got things I got to work on too because that shouldn't even bother me. But you know what you call that? Rude. And when somebody acts that way, does it ever cross my mind? Well, there goes a good Christian man. There goes a good Christian woman. No, because you're on fire inside. Oh, you think if I could only be so wealthy that they couldn't take enough money from me and I wouldn't kill them, you'd just T-bone them, would you not? Huh. If they didn't act right, you'd go boom and hit them, right? you think, well, ah, there you go. But then would that be love on my side? Of course not. Of course not. And you, you may sit there today and say, well, I've got my rights. I can say whatever I want to say. I cannot say whatever I should say. I've got my rights. I think God called us to a higher standard than that, people. Than a bigger concern than what your rights are. Instead, God wants us to be asking in everything that we do and in every reply and response that we have is, is that love? I think that's the question God expects us to ask about everything. 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 Is this love, and is the way I'm replying, responding, is that love? See, if I T-bone that car, I don't think the Lord would do that, which means I shouldn't either. As bad as you may want to, I don't even think the Lord blows his horn. and throws up his hand, he's like, can you say thank you? <laughs> no, I don't think the Lord does that. Do you have the right to say what you want to say? Yeah, you do. But is it love? Do you have a right just to come in and dominate a conversation? Just interrupt and cut somebody else off while they're speaking? Do you have a right to pretend that you don't hear somebody when you clearly do? I guess you've got the right, but the question is, is, is that love? Is it within your right as a person just to snap at the waitress because things wasn't done the way you wanted, when you wanted, how you wanted? Snap at the person down here checking you out to Walmart because they uh, didn't have a sticker on one of the things and there you wait. Do you have the right? I guess you do. But is it a show of love? According to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Think about it. The love that Jesus shown throughout the scripture it's sure not rude. The love Jesus showed did not behave itself unseemly. We get a picture in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 20. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Now we know if we say that, he's really talking about the church door. At the church door of the New Testament church and of Christians' hearts. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me come in, I come in and eat with you and you eat with me. Now Jesus of all person could rear back and stick up that foot and kick the door down. He got every right to. But he doesn't behave himself unseemly even at that. He knocks politely. Said, let me come in. Do what I say to do. Hear my word. Wouldn't it be nice if people, Christians, were polite like Jesus was? No, he didn't force himself upon anyone. And Jesus, according to everything I read about him, he had such a love that he served others. 
He said, I, the son of man, have not come to be served, but I have come to serve. Yeah, he understood what it was to love. And when somebody did him wrong, he didn't turn around and figure out how he was going to get even and make their life miserable. He didn't curse them. He didn't go tell secrets he knew on them or lie on them. You think of what Judas did as we studied in Sunday school class this morning, how Judas done the Lord. And what Jesus do against him before he died to make sure he got even? Not one thing. Jesus had what you call love, according to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Another thing about Jesus is while you're talking, he listens. See, he's not rude. While you're talking to him, while you're talking to the heavenly father, Lord listens. Even though he knows what you're getting ready to ask for and knows what you need before you get ready to ask for it, he doesn't butt in. He doesn't throw a lightning bolt and say, shut up, I know what you need. Now let me think about it. Even when you're asking for the forgiveness of your sin that he knows you've already committed, he doesn't interrupt you. You know why? Because love is not rude. Love does not act unseemly. And Jesus is the perfect example of this here. Jesus even opens doors for you. Did you know that? That's pretty nice. It used to be when you went to somewhere, if you got from here to there and somebody's walking through the door, they kind of hold the door and you go on through. And then, of course, you say what? Thank you. Now it's as if they intentionally get in there and pull it behind them as fast as they can, say, slamming your nose, you know. Jesus says it like that. Even for the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul said in trust, he has opened doors for me of opportunity. The Lord has. He hasn't stopped opening doors of opportunity today to spread and to teach the gospel. Why? Because the love of Jesus Christ does not work unseemly. I wonder, has it been a while since people have showed you love and politeness, courtesy? Has it been a while since you've really noticed that in the world? Maybe even in the church. Not necessarily from Sims Hill, but I know there's people who have left a lot of churches because they were treated rudely. Would not come back even after they'd become Christians and served for some times was done. Because they were treated rudely. Many a marriage has come to an end because one or the other decided to act unseemly, rudely, uninterested, without love or desire or care, unless it benefited them. You see, that's not the love of a Christian. But most people can be very rude, can't they? Gosh, how rude people can be. So when we look at how rude people can be, why not receive the politeness, the courtesy of Jesus Christ? That's what he's here to offer. That's what he offers to those that are of his bride. Jesus is the groom of the church. Christians are that bride. Does not the groom cherish the bride? Does not the groom respect and honor the bride? You say, where can I get love and respect and honor from? The answer is the Lord. Not from people. But the honor and respect and love that the Lord gives you is what you have to cultivate into a love and an attitude of a Christian that you show to others. Why not let Jesus Christ do in our lives what he desires to do? He desires to cherish us and to love us. And I'll tell you what, any woman with a good Christian husband, a good Christian man, okay, that loves them and cherishes them and cares for them, a good woman ought to be drooling every day to have such a man today like that in today's time. Do you hear me? And any man that's got a good Christian woman should drool every day to have one in today's time. 
as hard as they are to find. Not act with attitude. A bride that loves her husband has no attitude towards the groom. They can't wait to be in contact with the groom. They can't wait to do good, to show love. And the same thing's true on the flip side of that coin of the groom to the bride. And that's what Jesus wants for us. Then, as we reflect on God's love towards us, we're more likely to be able to show that to other people and to have the kind of love that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. Sometimes, you know, if you see out Christians will put a bumper sticker on their car, talk about it being a Christian, whether it's a cross or a Bible verse, Acts 2.38 or whatever it may be. Sometimes they'll wear a shirt that says something about a Bible verse on it, showing that they're a Christian, showing other people that they follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes churches will come out and they'll issue shirts to their the local body, to the members there, and they'll have the name of the church on it and Bible verses or whatever. Oh, that's great and wonderful until we act unseemly. Until those people see us acting without love, without courtesy, without politeness, when they see us acting rude, and there we've got a bumper sticker, our T-shirt on the back says, Sims Hill Christian Church. Repent and be baptized to be saved and live faithfully until the end. Oh, that's wonderful. Until they see us or hear us or read our Facebook post or this thread or that thread, they see just how unseemly we're acting. Then we are a disappointment, put into an open shame the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you what, y'all, with the truth, if we're Christians, we wear Jesus Christ every day. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27 says, we put on Jesus Christ. We're baptized into Jesus Christ. We wear him every day. And when the people see you being rude... When the people see you acting like a fool or a nut or a psycho, is that not the opinion they have of your Lord then? Is that not the same opinion they have of your Savior? People make decisions based on watching us. Now, we can mess up things pretty bad as Christians. Sometimes you got to scrap it. you got to start rebuilding. You messed it up. Lord, will help you rebuild things maybe in a different way or a different situation. But you can't act unseemly. When we're kind, people assume Christ is kind. When we mess up and we ask for forgiveness and we have to rebuild and redo, the world sees that. As long as we handle it right and we do it right. People make decisions about Jesus and the church by watching us. Don't forget that. But when we're rude, brash, overbearing, people think that about our Savior too, that are outside Jesus Christ. A love and conduct, remember this, a love and conduct honors God. A loving conduct honors God when you're a Christian. No matter if you're in this church building, if you're at work, if you're at home, and you're in a private room with your spouse, a loving conduct honors God in everything that you do. And it is something that has to be learned, has to be worked with continually. When we have the right view of ourselves, and the right view of others, the right view, then it's easier to be humble, patient, kind. Keep in mind, every person that you meet is valuable. They're valuable to God. So valuable their souls are that he sent his own son to die, and Jesus come willingly to be a sacrifice for their souls. So that's pretty valuable. Maybe it helps the way you treat people and you act towards people when you realize they're as valuable as you are. Another thing to keep in mind, everybody we meet, 
everybody in this room, everybody we will come across today and for the next three days, seven days till we meet again, every single one of them have struggles. Every single one may be struggling with physical pain or disease, may be struggling with things going on in their life or school or work or relationships. But remember this, every person has a secret sorrow. So there may be a reason for their attitude here or there. And instead of you replying with the same attitude or the same harshness, the same rudeness, and acting in, re in vengeance, consider that, hey, maybe something going on in that person's life that I think God ain't going on in mine that would cause them to act that way. Keep in mind that when we express politeness to other people, when we're not rude, we can know maybe we've made their day a little bit brighter. At least we tried. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. That's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. We can know that our actions have a chance, if it's done with love, to encourage others. And that's the reason we forsake not the assembly. On the first day of the week is to come together. When the Christians come together to encourage and to lift up and to exhort one another. And then we can know we've treated others the way God wants us to. Express a love then that behaves itself no matter what situation you're in. When someone gives you a compliment, you say what? See, not everybody in here said thank you. The words still, those two words still exist, though we don't hear them. Thank you. If you need to go in my house or my garage and borrow something to use, you ask permission first. People don't do that anymore. They just assume what's yours. No matter how hard you work for it, well, they, they, they deserve it as much as you. They just go and get it. Now, that's rude. When somebody's talking, you don't interrupt. Somebody, something I was trained as a growing up, if you're going to talk to somebody or they're going to talk to you, you look them in the eye. You talk to them when you talk to them. They know that you're listening. They know you're here. Now today you've got so many perverts and so everybody's so messed up. They just kind of go. <laughs> Don't know if they're hearing you or not. They're acting unseemly. If you need somebody to do something for you, you say, please. Please. See, these are things love acting Seemly. When it's acting seemly, it don't act these ways that we've just discussed. Ultimately, and here's where I'll end finally, being crude and rude only brings troubles back to you. All right? If it's at work, you cut off the wrong guy in town today by being rude and crude, that law will stomp you in the ground. That law will blow your head off. They're liable to chase you for a week and burn your house down. Kill your dog, boil your rabbit. <laughs> Gotta be careful. We get usually what we've given, do we not? We get. You will reap what you sow. And if we've sowed hate, if we've sowed discord, if we've sowed argued, if we've sowed hatefulness, if we've sowed all of this stuff, comes the time that's what you reap. Or it's forgiveness for it. Don't mean the situation that you had before continues to go on the way you want it to, or life continues to go on, or the job, or this, or that, or the other. But I promise you, even in personal relationships, whether it's dating or whether it's husband or wife, you act unseemly, act uncaring and unloving, you act uh, repulsed, it'll come back around on you. And you ain't got no room to whine and cry then. All you do is ask the Lord for forgiveness and to make everything all right and the next time maybe to be better, if you will, because you've just learned it never pays to be rude. It never pays to act unseemly. It will always come back on you. 
and the Lord was the perfect example. And we've stayed in Wednesday nights now for weeks about the conduct of a Christian, the attitude of a Christian, and it lines right up with what we stayed in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter here this morning. It's not an easy life. Having that kind of love is difficult, and it has to be worked on and prayed on continually. But it is expected by God that you live that kind of life with that kind of love. That's expected. Because he sent Jesus to die for your sin. And he wants to cherish you. He wants to love you. He wants to show you and help you to feel exactly what his kind of love is. But he can't do that if you're not a Christian. And he can't do that even for you as a Christian if you will not rely upon his word and repent and change daily. Changing your life to be obedient to him. But you sure can't feel that love and compassion and caring for G from Jesus Christ if you're not first his. We have to put on Christ. And that's by repenting, confessing your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and then straightway being baptized to be saved. If you haven't done that in your life to this point, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation, first verse of our invitation hymn, and we want you to come. And we want you to make Jesus Christ your Savior by being obedient to his word. And then go forth perfecting this love that we read about in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. The world may not understand it. The world may scoff at it and mock at it. But we're here to please the Lord first, right? Not the world. And that's got to be your attitude. We'll stand and sing a hymn of invitation, verse 1.
Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sin, and that afterwards you will receive the dwelling of the Holy Spirit.
Savior. We want to serve the communion. And I'll ask you to bow your heads and I'll pray a prayer for it. If you would, you just want to sit down for a minute and serve you. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to baptize this lady and child. Thank you, Father, so much for her decision. Ask, Father, that you be with us now as we come around the table a little bit. Thank you for the loaf, which is just kind of broken body. Your cup, which is just kind of shed blood. Be with us now. Forgive us of our sins. In my prayer in your son's name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Mom, would you dismiss the stage?